أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to our dear viewers that have joined us this week for episode number 21. So uh, this episode is titled uh, The Post-COVID Muslim Student Survival Guide. Uh, and we have <coughs> with us today uh, Ustad Abu Hanifa Suhail, who is an educator and mashallah, he also uh, advises a lot of the teachers uh, up and down the country. So inshallah, a lot of the questions that we're going to be talking about uh, are in regards to sort of student life in secondary school, college and university level. So, um, Ustad, how's it going? How are you? Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Great to uh, speak to you, Saleh. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So let's get started. I know you're short of time. So uh, let's get right in. So one of the first questions I have for you, Ustad, is what advices would you give to Muslim students who have just started school, college or uni again? Uh, before I let you go on with that question, obviously, you know, um, during this period of lockdown, the, especially amongst our students, uh, something myself as a teacher I'm dealing with is anxiety and stress amongst students. And then coming back after all this time, some of them may, may be nervous, some of them may be worried in regards to their grades and things like that. So what advice would you give some of these students? Yes, Zakhmullah uh, khair. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Now, at the beginning of the lockdown back in March, uh, I think the idea of, um, you know, five months of school, uh, students and teachers, both of them were jumping for joy, doing cartwheels, excited about the time off. But when the reality actually sunk in, that it wasn't just a case of being off school, but it was many of the structures in our society were taken away, our routines, our ability to go out, our friendships, the masajid. So this uh, led to really a number of problems which disproportionately affected young people. So there's been a lot of uh, reports in the media and anecdotal evidence of young people suffering from anxiety, suffering from stress. And anxiety and stress, or as is known as in Arabic, ham and huzn, these things really accelerate when you worry about things out of your control when you worry about uh, things which you have no say over, when you worry about things which there's nothing you can do about. So my most important advice to Muslim students out there, and in fact, anybody who's really returning to studies, returning to work, whatever background they're from, is to take one day at a time and to focus on those things which you have control over. You don't have control over whether there'll be a second lockdown. You don't have control over, um, you know, uh, what next year's grades, uh, how they will be decided, whether you're going to sit exams or whether you're going to uh, actually rely on CAG center assessed grades. So focus on the things you do have control over, which is just taking one day at a time, making it into school or university, starting your lessons and Remember that everyone is pretty much in the same boat. It's like just you've been off school, so have your teachers been off school. And it's really about reconnecting. It's just about getting those structures back into place again. Focus on that one day at a time. Exactly. I think that last advice of focusing one day at a time is really, really important. I think sometimes what students do, especially those that are of, uh, of an older age, they sort of think, you know, have 100 thoughts at the same time and they put too much on their plate and put too much on their shoulders, unfortunately, and it becomes difficult for them to uh, deal with anxiety and stress, isn't it? Uh, hey, uh, no worries. So I'll go straight into it once, uh, once again, inshallah. So obviously myself and you, we've been speaking in regards to the situation of Salah and Jum'ah at school. So what advice would you give uh, to our students in regards uh, to that, inshallah? Yeah, subhanAllah, you know, uh, when it comes to da'wah, we tend to focus a lot on things like lectures, articles, um, speeches, uh, when in fact the strongest form of da'wah is action. So when uh, people are returning to school, return to college, university, and they're facing so many different anxieties, and they see Muslims are bending over backwards, really jumping through hoops to try and establish 
the salah. It is the most powerful form uh, of da'wah. It shows to the whole world that the thing that Muslims value most above all is religion. And that is very inspiring to others. You know, they're trying to just get to grips with their daily routines, uh, grades, earning a living. And here come a group of people who, for whom belief in God, worshipping God, praying to God is more important than anything else. So it is a very powerful form of da'wah, and it is a great opportunity for you to come out of the shadows, for you to achieve something great. So if you're, uh, you know, year nine, year 10, year 11, secondary school, or even college or university, and you've always been on the fringes, uh, really uh, not taking center stage, not really having the opportunity to do much for Islam, this is your opportunity. Uh, as we know that in terms of schools and colleges, they are going to be in what's called year group bubbles, which makes it very difficult to hold a Juma Salah for different year groups. So now there is a need for year seven to have their own Juma, year eight to have their own Juma, year nine, 10, 11 in college, year 12 have their own Juma, year 13 have their own Juma with their own Imam, with their own Mu'addin. This provides opportunities for you to step out of the shadows and do a great service to Islam, and just prepare a basic khutbah using one of the guides, and take the responsibility on your shoulders uh, to be the one who leads the salah, to be the one who organizes the salah. Try and even motivate other Muslim teachers. They may be slacking, they may be more worried about their lesson. It's a great opportunity for you to step out of the shadows to do something great for Islam. And this is our heritage. You know, in the past, some of the great leaders like Sultan Fatih, by 12 years old, Umar ibn al-Abdul Aziz, they were governors of, uh, of cities and regions. Uh, you know, our society teaches te teenagers they're not really worthy of anything except just being consumers. This is your chance to do a great service for Islam. Jazakallah uh, khair, Ustaz. So obviously, as you've mentioned, that due to the situation we find ourselves in schools, Obviously, uh, uh, year groups have been split into bubbles. So obviously, we know and we understand in certain schools, Jum'ah may be restricted, uh, wudu yeah. areas may be restricted. So as a student, let's say, who is, you know, who's praying his uh, daily salawat and he's not able to play, uh, pray, what advice do you give to the student? What can he do to make sure that he's allowed to pray in school? Yeah, so there is a, there is a problem with the question, uh, what if he's not allowed to pray? Uh, there is no such thing as not allowed to pray you start off with the premise that salah is the most important thing for me there is no such thing as not allowed to pray that just as there's no such thing as not allowed to have lunch or not allowed to go to the toilet or not allowed to breathe there is no such thing as not allowed to pray salah now if the school has restrictions uh challenges uh guidelines uh, health and safety um, uh, uh, initiatives which you need to follow, then alhamdulillah we'll work with the school, we'll work with the college, we'll work with the university. Uh, take the approach, not that I'm asking permission from you to pray salah, just like I don't need permission from you to breathe, but it's about let's see where we, how we can work together. Let us see how we can compromise. Uh, let us see how we can work something out which is mutually beneficial. That's the attitude to take. Not can I pray? I will pray, but I want to pray in a way uh, which is, uh, doesn't uh, uh, mess up your own risk assessment, uh, doesn't cause any problems for you as an institution. So let's work together and let's make this happen. That's the attitude that Muslim students should have. Now, on a practical level, just a couple of uh, bits of advice. On a practical level, um, uh, I would advise you to do mus on your socks or on your leather socks. So, you know, open, taking off your socks and putting your, busting out your feet into the sink at a time when people are really uh, quite sensitive about, you know, splash from water, uh, cross infection, be sensitive to the people around you. So if you follow the view that it is permissible to wipe over the socks, then alhamdulillah in the morning, do wudu, put your socks on and for the rest of the day, just wipe over the socks. So it's very simple for you to make wudu. Uh, if you are following the Hanafi school of thought, which believes the socks, uh, wiping over the socks, the must can only take place if the, they are leather hoofs, 
uh, leather socks, then no problem. Just make sure you do wudu in the morning, put your leather socks on, and then put your shoes on and come to school, college, or university. And then for the rest of the day, make your life a lot easier. When it comes to making wudu, you can just use a regular sink uh, and just make mas'a with the socks. Jazakallah khair, Ustad. Okay, alhamdulillah. So I, I like the way you uh, answered that question, mashallah. It's a, it's a mindset issue, isn't it, Ustad? We need to understand, exactly. especially as younger students, that no matter what the situation is, mm. we're, we're always allowed to pray salah, isn't it? It's a right upon us, right, for us to yeah. be able to pray salah. So I yeah. think, mashallah, that is the best way for us to uh, approach that issue as teachers as well as students. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Khairan, so obviously, Alhamdulillah, as we know, um, our last year 11s got their results uh, during the summer, as well yeah. as a lot of our age, A2 students. So these students that have just finished secondary school, that have just finished college, they go, uh, uh, they're going into completely new territory. Some uh, year 11s are going into college, uh, college students are going into university. And we know these two uh, um, sort of arenas are completely different. College is yeah. completely different, school life, University, again, is completely different to how college life is. And, you know, there's yeah. lots of uh, fitan that some of our uh, brothers and sisters may face. So on yeah. that note, what advice uh, would you give on preserving your Islamic identity for those students that have just started university or that have just started college? Uh, that's a good question. Very good question. You see, um, it all starts from really um, what is your vision in life? What do you want to actually achieve with your life it can be quite deceptive sometimes you might find a brother with a beard who prays or a sister with a hijab um, you know and jilbab who seems to observe uh, the instructions of islam uh, the uh, commands and prohibitions of islam but often this can be something uh, quite cultural uh, based on your family your surroundings and you really got no idea why you're doing these things so it really starts off uh, with your own vision and aim in life. What is, exactly uh, is it that you want to achieve in life? Do you want to be uh, somebody who has a high level in the hereafter? Do you want to be uh, somebody who in the sight of Allah uh, is somebody great? So once you have that vision, then solutions will automatically come. And one of the most important solutions is good company. You need to, as a first priority, Try and identify uh, who will be your close friends. Where do you belong? So looking towards the Islamic societies, looking uh, towards people who have a similar outlook uh, on life to you, and very much uh, finding uh, your belonging in this new institution. That can be difficult at first, especially if you don't know many people. But you shouldn't be surprised if people who you formerly were very close to, as they start, they may start drifting away from you, if they don't share the same outlook, uh, the same priorities. So good company is really key. And you want to make sure that from the very beginning, you establish yourself with a good company of Muslims. Jazakallah khair, Ustad. Also, you, uh, while you're uh, advising that you mentioned joining uh, Islamic societies and sort of uh, societies where you know, Islam is being established, I remember talking to a couple of youth, uh, youth recently that have just gone into university and I advised them, you know, one of the most important things that they can do in regards to preserving their Islamic identity is making sure that not only do they get involved in the Islamic society, but also sort of taking senior roles on so, uh, university. University can be a means of development for them. And this is, I think, is also um, uh, quite important for our youth, uh, our brothers and sisters that are going into college uh, or university. So uh, you also touched up, uh, touch up on vision. So obviously someone that's just gone to college, they're quite young, and even someone going into university, they might not be familiar with what a vision is and what, a, what the vision a Muslim student should have. Could you just elaborate a bit more on that, please, Ustad? Yeah, sure. So it's not complicated. A, a vision is really uh, what you want to achieve in life. What is it uh, that is your ambition? Now, I'm not talking about things like uh, you want to become a doctor or an engineer or a, a, you know, or a playwright or a novelist. I'm not talking about these kind of things. This is uh, merely career aspirations. But what is it that your high-level uh, uh, goal is in life? 
Now, the Prophet ﷺ had very clear vision to make the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest. So from the beginning of prophethood to the end, he did not swerve from that aim. Now, it might be difficult, especially if you're used to quite a relaxed kind of uh, lifestyle, you know, not too much pressure, uh, not too much thinking, to be honest, a lot of entertainment. You might not even have a vision. So you need, really need to come to grips with what is it you want to achieve in life. It might not be very clear to you where your belonging is, where you can contribute to Islam, where you can uh, help uh, establish the cause of Islam. But uh, what is it that you want to achieve out of life? What is it uh, that is your central goal in life? That is a question you need to get to grips with. Uh, and if in the past uh, you've just been really following Islam because of uh, traditions and culture, something that was passed down, from your parents and you've really got no idea why you're following it then uh, there's a great danger as soon as the environment changes your practice will change as well to try and focus on what is your central goal in life so i think uh, they've cleared that up uh, for our viewers so obviously um i mentioned for um our young brothers and sisters that are going into college and university well, like there's so many different fitting out there, especially once you go onto the university scene, you know, you're exposed to so many different ideas, you know, such as atheism, which you've been exposed to throughout your whole life, but not such an extent where it's constantly in your face. So obviously one of the advices that you mentioned was that, you know, uh, get involved in the Islamic society uh, and, you know, try to be with a good jama'ah. Other than that, what else, what else can these students do to make sure that, you know, they're not being corrupted by uh, these uh, isms and schisms that be, they're being uh, exposed to? Yeah, I mean, uh, these uh, fitan, uh, which is an Arabic word for trials, tribulations, challenges, they exist in every sphere of life. Don't think it's just for university. You know, you can be sitting in the comfort of your home and exposed to so many challenges and trials and tribulations, especially on the uh, online, especially in the online world, on social media platforms. So don't think it's just for university, it's everywhere. Uh, personally, uh, I found that uh, after you have clarity of your vision, of the central goal and aim of your life, uh, you have a good uh, set, a good um, group of friends that you trust, who are good company, then one of the most important steps to not only protect yourself but to almost be on the offensive is to be well read yeah you need to uh have an open mind uh you need to read into these different philosophies these different ways of life uh what the fundamentals uh of their um uh of their belief systems are and you need to have the confidence to challenge when necessary you see, oftentimes it's just a social thing, you know, the humanist society, the this society, the that society. It's just a pure kind of social thing, just a group of guys who've got together uh, or a group of girls who've got together. And just they found they had something in common. And uh, the philosophy or the ideology was just a vehicle for them to just get together and have a good time. So by reading deeper by making you say, uh, yourself aware of the kind of ideological foundations of, uh, of, of that way of life, yeah, you can increase in confidence and you can be more secure in yourself to engage with them. Uh, don't be afraid to have dialogue, to, to have question and answers, to make sure to be open to discuss. Don't be afraid of that. And uh, uh, alhamdulillah, you have a good grounding in religion. Uh, and you're not going to just uh, kind of hide away in a cocoon. Be, you know, engage those people, speak to those people, but uh, make sure it's done uh, on a basis, a foundation or a good solid grounding of Islam, and make sure you are thoroughly read on these different uh, ideologies, philosophies, ways of life. Definitely uh, agree with that last point you mentioned, Ustad. You know, when you're exposed to these things, sometimes it can cause confusion however sometimes you know when you're well grounded in these sciences like it gives you more yakin and more certainty in your own belief isn't yeah. it you think yeah. you know what like islam is the truth it, yeah. it, Islam makes so much sense so sometimes it's actually good for us even though it may be a trial and tribulation for many of us sometimes yeah. it, it works in our favor and gives us that yakin that we uh, crave and sort of 
look out for. Uh, so, yeah. so moving away from that, and uh, we've got a question here, I think, from uh, one of the audience members. Um, it says, if our education establishment doesn't have an Islamic society, then how yeah. may we go about creating an Islamic environment? So what, what advice would you give to these brothers that don't really have the brotherhood, the sisterhood, where they're able to, you know, meet up on a regular basis? What, what can these students do? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. I mean, the Islamic society is just a, a vehicle to achieve your aim. It doesn't even have to be there. Uh, I think Islamic societies are more for universities where there's very much a culture of student activism, uh, creating societies, you know, creating forums. But if you're, for example, now talking about college, you know, uh, setting up study groups, you know, hanging out together, uh, you know, Islam as a religion, it automatically creates structure. As soon as you walk through the door and you need to know what time the next salah is, any salah is only two or three hours away. You will then have to find a prayer room. You will then have to organize yourself in a jama'ah. You'll have to know where to make wudu. So automatically, Islam creates structure. Uh, it creates a kind of a, a dynamic environment where uh, Muslims get to know each other. They get to build uh, uh, bridges with each other. They get to communicate with each other, organize together. So inshallah, don't stress too much about it if there's not formal society. Just by practicing Islam, just by establishing salah, just by discussing uh, what you're going to do at Ramadan time, uh, just by studying together, uh, you automatically create structures uh, and lasting structures where even if you leave, uh, you know, you'll keep tabs on what's happening with the prayer facility, what's happening with Juma, what's happening with teachers, and you'll inspire other Muslim teachers maybe to start praying Salah. So inshallah, Salah is not something to stress about. Uh, just through practicing Islam, you'll find avenues opening up to you. Exactly, uh, Ustad. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, sort of just to sort of add on to something uh, that you've said there. I think one thing um, students can do as well. Those of you uh, who may be uh, thinking about this question is: most schools, colleges, universities around London, especially, have Muslim staff. Sometimes what you could do is you could speak to the Muslim staff that are employed in that school, and you can work uh, with them in sort of creating that uh, Islamic society. But as Osai said, sometimes it's not, you know, it's, it's not about the society. It's you coming together with the brothers and the sisters will automatically uh, create that structure, uh, inshallah. Um, okay, uh, we've got another question here, Ustad. Um, it says, how do we create this Islamic environment that you've just mentioned when teachers may have fears of extremism if we create an Islamic society? Uh, very good Especially question. in this um, age of, you know, prevent, etc. Mm. A lot of people, particularly in education, are open-minded. Yeah, education is not a field which attracts um, a lot of right-wing, bigoted uh, Islamophobes. Uh, it tends to be people who are open-minded. It tends to be people who want to help uh, young people. Not many people go into education uh, you know, just for the money. So uh, I think you need to have an optimistic uh, open-minded mindset and you need to keep the lines of communication and dialogue open with your teachers with your principals with your head teachers with your senior leadership team uh, with your vice chancellors uh, be open be inviting so when you create islamic societies or this is kind of islamic environment uh, don't make it a closed insular uh, uh, ghettoized kind of um, uh, environment. Be open. Invite people. Invite your teachers uh, when you're having events. Make sure you've got refreshments. Make sure you know you bring some of that kind of cultural nuance. So maybe some of the special cuisine from the different Muslim countries. Maybe you know uh, the Bengalis could bring their special dishes. The Pakistanis could bring their special dishes. The Moroccans could bring their special dishes. So Islamic events don't have to be very hardcore lecture based. They could be based on cuisine. It could be very inviting and start to break down those barriers. You'll find that a lot of people will open up and you'll be surprised. People who you thought were very ignorant of Islam, they've, they're actually quite, especially if they're in areas where they have high concentrations of Muslims, they're actually quite well informed, but they've never had the opportunity to ask questions in the right environment. So maybe 
your job is to create that relaxed environment that people can ask. Uh, maybe even sort of um, simple things such as using your uh, adab, your akhlaq, and things like this to sort of call uh, the teachers who may be, who may be fearing ex uh, extremism. Uh, Khair, we don't have long left. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you before we sort of uh, end <clears throat> is obviously we've had such a huge amount of time off, nearly about five months off where students haven't been as studious as they usually would be. Maybe a lot of students fell behind. So yeah. what tips would you give to these students who may be stressing, thinking, you know, I've, I've fallen behind. What do I do now? How do I catch up? What tips yeah. do you give to these students? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, the question needs to uh, to be kind of reviewed. I've fallen behind. Fallen behind who? Uh, do you imagine that while you may have been a bit lazy, that everyone else was working really, really hard? The teachers themselves have fallen behind. Everyone's fallen behind. Everyone's in the same boat. That's quite important to emphasize. Everyone, virtually everyone, is in the same boat. And you've got to understand that exam grades are awarded in what's called a, a normative-based system. It's not uh, a question of you get a really hard exam paper and everyone does badly, everyone fails. There is a fixed percentage who must get, for example, the top grade, then a fixed percentage that gets the next top grade, and then a fixed percentage that gets the third top grade. So everyone is in the same boat. Just take it one day at a time and focus on the things that are within your control. One lesson at a time. Make sure you get to the lesson. Make sure you wake up early enough. Make sure you're prepared with the right equipment. It's these small, small steps that you might not think as very big, but you've had five months without these steps. So you need to start retaking those steps one day at a time, one lesson at a time. And once you've done the lesson, just read over your notes highlighting key points, and then move on to the next lesson next day. So do those simple things. And remember, you're all in the same boat, and grades are awarded on fixed percentages. So kind of like you're all together as a single cohort, which should alleviate a lot of that stress and anxiety. Sometimes I think what happens, especially as uh, students, and even sometimes even as adults, we try to have things, we, have, we try to have everything under our control. However, sometimes mm -hmm. we need to realize some things are out of our control. And this mm -hmm. is when uh, the sort of the point of tawakkul comes in, isn't it? We do our bit, we do everything that we can, and the, less, uh, the rest we leave uh, up to Allah. Um, we've got about three minutes left, Ustad. Are you okay to take one last question? Yeah, of course. Okay, so a uh, question here, I think from YouTube again. It says, for university students, majority of the year could be online. Uh, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for university ISOCs to best use this time? Mm. Uh, good question. That uh, uh, I am not a great fan of online uh, lessons. Um, you know, it, it's done its job during the lockdown, but I think I'm looking forward to the time uh, when universities are fully open and people are attending lectures. And I'm not really sure why universities uh, kind of are closed for so much longer than other educational establishments. So I don't know, maybe somebody from a university background can clarify uh, that for me. Uh, but it's the best we can do uh, while institutions are closed. So again, it's just about doing the best you can do in that situation. So make sure you attend the online lessons, perhaps have uh, a particular room which you dedicate as your study area uh, and have that routine of waking up early, attending the lesson, you know, taking notes, uh, you know, just to make sure you're active. Don't just switch your camera off and then shoot off somewhere just to kind of deceive your lecturers that you're still listening in. Uh, it's the best you can do in this situation. So always be optimistic, always be positive. One of the worst things you can be is a perfectionist. Yeah, you might be surprised by hearing that. One of the worst things you can do is be a perfectionist because a perfectionist. Perfection is actually someone who achieves perfection. It's a person who actually doesn't do things because they're not prepared to do anything which is below perfection. So if the best thing we can, uh, uh, that we can explore is online lessons at the moment,
then okay, let's go for it. Let's try and get the best out of it. It's not as good as being in a lecture hall, uh, having that personal communication with the with the teacher. It's not as good as that, but it's the best we can do. So let's at least uh, make a start with it. Uh, and you'd be surprised how much you've picked up, how much you've learned, but critically, you've not given up. The worst thing you can do is just give up. So keep it going, keep it moving, try your best, you know, take some notes, attend the lectures, you know, make sure you're not sitting there in your pajamas, get changed, you know, at least get into that routine so that when the actual university is open, you're in a better place. Jazakallah khair, Ustad. It's been uh, great having you. And I'm sure what we discussed today has been of great benefit to a lot of our viewers today and to many of our viewers who may be uh, watching afterwards. Um, is there any last thing you'd like to say before we wrap up or you're good to go? No, alhamdulillah, just, um, just uh, 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 an encouragement uh, to the brothers and sisters out there that, you know, the world has changed forever. But with any change comes opportunity, yeah? Uh, everyone has been stuck at home with more time to reflect, more time to think about the purpose of their life, and more time to realize that those things which we thought were the most important things in life, uh, schools, colleges, universities, work, uh, entertainment, going out, cinemas, all of those things that people dedicated their lives to, they're actually not as important as we thought they were because we managed without them. So it gives an opportunity for people and people are thinking uh, more about spirituality, spirituality, the purpose of your life. This is where you guys have a unique opportunity to fill that gap, to answer people's questions and to provide opportunities that nobody else can provide. Yeah, you might be in the university and you might have the potential to organize that kind of event that nobody else has the opportunity to organize. And it could be a means for people to come so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So never underestimate the opportunities that you have. And uh, never underestimate that those uh, small steps that you do now, the kind of impact they will have later in your life and the lives of others. Jazakallah khairan. Jazakallah khair, Ustad. Uh, you recently actually mentioned something uh, I found really, really profound. You said, you know, uh, us as students, teachers, you know, being in this educational environment, Allah, we have opportunities granted to us that hasn't been granted to anyone be it the you know the greatest scholar of our time be it the you know the greatest footballer of our time whoever they may be we're in a very unique and privileged uh, situation so we need yeah. to as you said you know make the most of that and try to bring as much benefit as we can if we're a student or even if we are a teacher uh, on that note uh, Usad, Allah, jazakallah khair for your time really Lovely. really appreciate it I really enjoyed it, Saleh. Jazakumullah khair and Jazakumullah khair to the viewers, inshallah, for listening. Jazakumullah khair to our viewers that have watched uh, episode number 21. Um, inshallah, we ask all our viewers to inshallah su uh, subscribe, like, and share our videos. We will see you uh, next Friday for episode number 22. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.